This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. Economist Simon Johnson explains that economic inequality is due in large part to the information and technology revolutions that have redefined what a job is. Political scientist Ian Milheiser tells us that technology is what has allowed the gerrymandering that is keeping Republicans more in control than the voters want. And Bill Press talks with Congressman David Cicilline. Are you tired of Tea Party Republicans and Rush Limbaugh dominating the airwaves? Do you want the facts you won't get on Fox or even on CNN? Then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. MIT economist Simon Johnson is an expert on international finance and the American economy as well. He says income inequality remains stubborn because of the technological revolution that has changed the nature of so many jobs. And joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats, Simon Johnson, former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund, is the Ronald A. Kurtz Professor of Entrepreneurship at the MIT Sloan School of Management and co-author of White House Burning, The Founding Fathers, Our National Debt, and Why It Matters to You. Simon Johnson, thanks so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thanks for having me. The entire world economy seems to still be on shaky ground. Uh, in in your, your opinion, what countries are in the shakiest conditions? Well, I think the, the European economy is still uh, really on, on thin ice. Uh, the European periphery, countries such as uh, Greece, Portugal, Spain, Ireland, and, and even Italy, um, are, um, I'm afraid, um, something of a powder keg, which, uh, if, if lit, um, could cause great damage to the world economy. A lot of folks have, have made comparisons of the U.S. economy to, to, to the Eurozone. Is that, is that not an unfair way to, uh, there's no comparison there, I should say? Well, I think the, the comparison is often um, mis misused and, and, and misrepresented. It's true that bo both uh, economies, our economy and the European economy, had big credit booms. Ours was around housing. Theirs was a combination of, of housing, banking, and, and, and public sector debt. But, but there the parallel pretty much ends. The, the, European, the core of the European problem is they built a currency union without enough of a foundation both on, the, on their fiscal accounts and in terms of financial regulation. This currency union is now under enormous pressure and some countries may well end up dropping out of it. We don't have anything like that in, in the United States, although, of course, we're still struggling to recover from the financial disaster of 2007, 2008. Well, and of course, some of the conversation in the U.S., of course, are cuts, 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 and a huge argument has developed among economists as to the value of austerity or deep spending cuts in various countries. Some point to Ireland as an example of austerity working, but others say... Uh, in country after country, austerity has done nothing to increase employment. Where do you come down on this? Well, look, austerity is never something you want to be forced into. If you have to make uh, precipitate cuts in government spending or if you have to jack up tax rates uh, in short order, this is going to be disruptive and it's going to slow down the economy. What you need to do in a situation like the United States, for example, is phase in adjustments to the, to the budget. So over two decades, strengthen the revenue base of the federal government and bring health care spending under control. That will sort out the fiscal difficulties without being disruptive to the real economy. The Europeans are in a very different place. They are taking measures that we, we, we don't need to do in the United States and we shouldn't even consider them. Everyone in the, in the budget debate talks, it seems, um, they talk about the need for, for tax reform. But the last time it happened, in 1986, the results didn't do much for erasing inequality, did they? That is true to some degree. Remember, the, the big driver uh, of uh, rising inequality since, since the mid-1980s has been technology, technology change, and to some extent, international trade. So th those are trends that were not completely clear to the designers of the tax reform in, in the mid-1980s. And if you were to do it again, or if, or if you're going to do a new tax reform, you would need to take into account these very strong inequality worsening trends that appear to have got built into our, built into our economy now. So this is a very different world from, from the world of 19, 
8586 in terms of what drives inequality and, and what can counteract that in, in, in the tax system. Well, those trying to develop the tax reform, looking into, I mean, how much can they look into the future? I mean, you can look at the trends of today, but I mean, when you have a technological boom like we saw in the 90s, uh, that's really hard. It's hard to foresee anything like that. And so is it something that needs to be addressed maybe more often? And that's part of the reform is that we, hey, we got to go back and look at it in every 10 years? Well, I don't think you'll find the political will to do it every 10 years, but certainly every 20 to 30 years, you do need to look at it. And it's a technology change. It's the information technology uh, revolution. It's a, what people call job polarization, so the disappearance of middle class, middle income jobs. That's a big change since mm-hmm. the mid-1980s. And the people at the, the top 1 to 5% have done very well. People lower down have, have, have had a very tough ride. And yes, you can, to some extent, address that through the progressivity of the tax system. We're speaking with Simon Johnson, former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund. He is the Ronald A. Kurtz Professor of Entrepreneurship at the MIT Sloan School of Management and co-author of White House Burning, The Founding Fathers, Our National Debt, and Why It Matters to You. Simon, do you agree with what seems to be a consensus that President Obama's 2009 stimulus program worked well, but would have worked better if it were even larger? Well, I think that that's a hard call to make. Um, remember that politically it was very hard to get even that scale through Congress. And yes, if you had added uh, a little bit more stimulus, that would have been a bit more helpful. But the idea you could have done two or three times that stimulus and made it effective, I think that, that that's a bit of a stretch. Now, I'm, I'm critical of what the first Obama administration did on some dimensions, but I think on, on the fiscal stimulus at that moment, they did about as much as, as they could realistically do. Do you think it was a mistake for him to, for the president to, to take on the affordable health care as strongly as he did right there when, when clearly what we needed were, were economic improvements over anything else? So I've heard that argument well, a lot. Per- yeah. <laughs> well, personally, I would have changed the order of priorities and put the financial sector reforms front and center while people were still focused on that and understanding the issues. And so I, I think the Affordable Care Act was, was worth taking up, but they, I would have done that after pushing for the financial sector reforms. That, that would have made, the logic of that, I think, would have been more compelling to people. Mm-hmm. Now, you've expressed some concern about President Obama's selection of Jack Lew as Treasury Secretary and Mary Jo White as Chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Why is that, since I mean, they, seemingly they both are, are very experienced? Well, Jack Lew comes from the uh, Robert Rubin side of democratic politics. It's been very pro-Wall Street. Uh, he previously he worked in, in Treasury in, in, in the administration with Rubin. Then he worked at Citigroup also also with Rubin. Citigroup, of course, ran itself into, into the ground uh, un, under that leadership. So I, I think there's, there's concerns there about the extent to which he understands the need for financial sector reform and for reining in the very big banks. As for Mary Jo White, she's a very accomplished uh, prosecutor, and it remains to be seen what her policy attitude is on financial sector reform. There are some key pieces that need to be move forward, including the, the Volcker rule, and the SEC is going to be central to that. But we really don't know where Mary Jo White uh, stands on these issues. You would think that folks so close to uh, to the financial catastrophe that we, we that we have seen over the last five to seven years would have learned or be able to learn from it and then, in fact, turn around and do well as, say, Treasury Secretary or Chair of the SEC. Yes, you would you would hope that. Um, unfortunately, when you when you actually get into the trenches, uh, many of the people at Treasury have a uh, an attitude that the financial sector should be put back on its feet, uh, pretty much um, in, in its previous form. And uh, the SEC also has people who have um, not yet been able to really uh, move the reforms forward for various reasons. So we need new strong leadership in, in both places, and. Um, I'm skeptical of Mr. Liu. I'm perhaps a little less skeptical of Mary Jo White, but we'll, but we'll see. And the jury remains out on, on both of them. We're uh, speaking with Simon Johnson. He is a co-author of White House Burning, The Founding Fathers, Our National Debt, and Why It Matters to You. Overall, Simon, how has President Obama handled the economy? And, and, and do you think he'll be remembered more like an FDR or more like a Herbert Hoover, or is it too early to tell? Well, we obviously avoided a Great Depression, which was which is a very good thing, and so Mr. Obama has to get uh, some serious points for that. However, the, the measures that were taken in and around the financial sector were, were overly generous, too much of a bailout, too much of a 
creation or reinforcement of moral hazard and, and the incentive uh, not to be careful. And we didn't really end the problem of too big to fail around the banks. So Mr. Obama's record to this point is, is, is mixed. But of course, it's over. He has another four years, and, and he could really press forward, particularly with the financial reform issues, in a way that would be most helpful for, for economic growth and shared prosperity over the coming decade. After the election, um, a, a lot of folks said, well, there it is. He, he has, um, you know, it's, it's, it's his to do with whatever he wants because the people have spoken. They put him back in office for four more years. How, how much of an upper hand does the president have as far as the economy goes? How much does he have to acquiesce to Republican demands? Well, he, he has uh, important scope for maneuver on, on key dimensions. No question about that, including around implementation of financial sector reforms. And uh, he, he could really change the tone of the debate around too big to fail problems of, of, of the mega banks, the global mega banks uh, on Wall Street. The House Republicans um, are, however, a, a major impediment to uh, legislation on these issues, and I don't think they're going to want to cooperate on financial sector reform. So it, it remains to be seen how much the president really wants to take this on and, and confront um, the special interests and, and the Republicans on this issue. Okay. Simon Johnson, former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund. He is the a, a Ronald A. Kurtz Professor of Entrepreneurship at the MIT Sloan School of Management and co-author of White House Burning, The Founding Fathers, Our National Debt, and Why It Matters to You. Simon, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. We look forward to speaking with you again soon. I look forward to that also. Thanks very much. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future and help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. Gerrymandering has been done throughout history by both parties, but the current malapportionment of the House of Representatives is the result of new technology, says political scientist Ian Milheiser. What's more, he says, progressives are to blame for living so close together that they can be marginalized by Republican state legislatures. That's coming up in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Some consider it un-American to like anything about those namby-pamby European nations. But still, let's hear it for the Swiss. In a March referendum, the mild-mannered, pacifist-minded Swiss people rose up and hammered their bank executives who've been grabbing rip-off pay packages. Two-thirds of voters emphatically shouted yes to a maverick proposal requiring that shareholders be given the binding say on executive pay. Violators of the new rules would sacrifice up to six years of salary and face three years in jail. That's hardly namby-pamby. Indeed, it's America's lawmakers and regulators who've been squishy-soft on Baxterism. None of the Wall Street titans who enrich themselves with rip-off pay packages while running financial scams that wrecked our economy have even been pursued by the law, much less put in jail. It's no surprise, then, that they've gone right back to scamming and grabbing rip-off pay. Hardly a week goes by without another revelation of big bank fraud, yet the banks just pay an inconsequential fine and the culprits skate free. Forget too big to fail, banks have become too big to jail. Our nation's top prosecutor, Attorney General Eric Holder, recently conceded that finagling financial giants are being given a pass. It does become difficult for us to prosecute them, he testified. We are hit with indications that if we do bring a criminal charge, it will have a negative impact on the national economy. This is Jim Hightower saying, Meanwhile, just four banks, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and Wells Fargo, put nearly $20 million into last year's elections, mostly to back Republicans promising to weaken the few feeble restraints we now have on banker thievery. Our lawmakers and regulators want to coddle the big bankers. With such keystone cops overseeing them, why would any Wall Streeter even think of going straight? Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? 
Well, here's an easy to swallow pill for you the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand up Democrats. We all know that the way congressional districts are drawn is unfair, but until courts strike down gerrymandering as unconstitutional, political scientist Ian Milheiser says it doesn't make sense for Democrats to unilaterally disarm. The key, however, is winning back state legislatures, he says. And joining us now on AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats, Ian Milheiser is the senior con- constitutional policy analyst for the Center for American Progress, where his work focuses on the Constitution and the judiciary. Ian previously was a policy analyst and blogger for Think Progress, held the open government portfolio for Center for American Progress's Doing What Works project, and was a legal research analyst with Think Progress during the nomination and confirmation of Justice Justice Sonia Sotomayor to the United States Supreme Court. Ian Milheiser, thanks very much for joining us on AmericasDemocrats.org. It's good to be here. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, As an expert on how Republicans are trying to subvert the Constitution and the political process, uh, (laughs) you must be tired (laughs) and busy. Um, what's the biggest threat coming from the political right that, that threatens the free expression of the popular will? Well, one thing we've been tracking for quite a while over at Think Progress is the problem of gerrymandering. Um, in the last election, Democrats actually received, or Democratic House candidates actually received about 1.4 million more votes um, for their candidates than Republicans received for theirs. But because of the way that these maps were drawn, you wound up with very, very, with a very intensely Republican House of Representatives. Republicans have more than a more than 30 seat advantage, and we actually ran the numbers and found that. Democrats would have to win in a landslide to take back the House of Representatives. That would be about a seven-point victory nationwide for them to take back the House. So you're seeing very serious gerrymandering being done to write the American people out of the equation and make it so that no matter who they vote for in the House races, Republicans will wind up uh, taking a majority. Well, now, Democrats have certainly used gerrymandering in the past to maintain an advantage in the House and and in state legislatures. How does what the Republicans are doing now differ? And isn't it redrawing, you know, boundary lines, kind of the essence of politics? I think what's changed is technology. I mean, gerrymandering has always been a problem, and I'm not going to excuse Democrats when they do it. I mean, I I think that partisan gerrymandering is unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. I think that that's shouldn't be a debatable point. Um, you know, we choose our own leaders in this country. We don't have them chosen for us. And when people in the state capital try to choose our leaders for us, that's wrong, no matter what party they belong to. Yeah. But what has happened is that um, the technology has changed in a way where we have such sophisticated computer modeling, we have such sophisticated data, and we're able to mine this data and dec- discover so much about where certain kinds of voters live that it's now possible to know what outcomes your map is going to produce so much better than you could even 10 years ago. So it happened to be the case that Republicans had a great year in 2010 they were able to use all this new technology, all this new computer modeling to draw these impossibly gerrymandered maps. And what this means is that we need to start taking our Constitution seriously. Our law needs to catch up with the technology and realize that we can't just leave this for the political process because the people who draw the maps can just be so very sophisticated now in making sure that they lock in their past victories. We're speaking with Ian Milheiser, senior constitutional policy analyst for Center for American Progress. One of the the Republican Party's most clever moves uh, began in the 1980s and continues today, and that is co-opting black leaders into going along with redistricting that guarantees them a seat while increasing Republican power in other districts. Is that cynical or is that just plain good politics? I mean, honestly, I think it's a bit of a red herring. 
you know, the, the Voting Rights Act has been around since 1965, and the Voting Rights Act protects, um, gives certain protection to minority voters and to minority districts. But the principle that African Americans, Latinos, and others should have the opportunity to choose their candidate is not necessarily in conflict with the principle that the state should reflect the partisan preference, the map should reflect the, the partisan preferences of the state as a whole. You know, you don't, you can have African American opportunity districts, you can have African American majority districts, you can have Latino majority districts without packing all of your Democrats who happen to be black or Latino into small Democrats, uh, into small district areas so that they don't catch votes in other places and endanger the Republicans. And I don't think these things need to be in tension with one another. Mm -hmm. Now, in Virginia, the evenly divided state Senate waited until a Democrat was out of town to attend President Obama's inauguration and then voted to redistrict itself, even though this was not a census year. Isn't the once every 10 years rule for redistricting binding? Um, it's actually unclear. There is a lower court decision in Virginia. So the, the Virginia Constitution says that every 10 years um, there shall be a redistricting, and there was a lower court decision which said that that means that you can't do it in the off years. Um, some state constitutions say, say that. Um, it's you know, probably this particular case, if that law passes, will ultimately wind up in front of the Virginia Supreme Court. But I want to point out that it's a double-edged sword here. You know, Jerry, partisan gerrymandering is unconstitutional, and it, the Supreme Court should strike it down. But until it is struck down, um, it wouldn't make sense for Democrats to unilaterally disarm by saying that they will let the Republicans draw whatever the map they want whenever they want. And the Democrats will just sit back and pretend like we live in the system that we should live in. Um, and so in the states where you can do mid-districting, uh, mid-decade redistricting, there's really nothing preventing the Democrats in those states, if they take back the legislatures, from uh, drawing new maps, which will undo some of the damage that we saw um, from these very gerrymandered maps in, 20, in 2010. Uh, uh, w if, if, if gerrymandering is unconstitutional, why are we still talking about it? Why is it still happening, on, you know, obviously on, on, on both sides of the aisle? W is it just because the Republicans and Democrats really don't want it to go away? Yeah, it's because our Supreme Court's terrible. Um, you know, there, there, there's been a series of Supreme Court decisions where the Supreme Court hasn't upheld partisan gerrymandering. It's never said it's constitutional. But what it's done is, is, it, is it said, like, oh, we don't want to get involved in this. This is too touchy. Um, and so, and it's always been the five conservative justices saying that they weren't going to touch it. Um, and that decision's wrong. Um, it's wrong for a lot of reasons. You know, we have a First Amendment in this country which says that you're not allowed to discriminate against people on the basis of their viewpoint. And so when you draw your maps to maximize people who agree, the views of people who agree with Republicans and minimize the votes of people who agree with the Democrats, that's viewpoint discrimination, First Amendment violation. You know, it's a violation of other principles that have been articulated in other decisions. And the Supreme Court needs to start doing its job because the Constitution is clear. Uh, the Supreme Court hasn't even come out and said that they think that this is constitutional. They've just said they don't feel like dealing with it, and that's wrong. Again, we're speaking with Ian Milheiser, Senior Constitutional Policy Analyst for Center for, for American Progress. Uh, what about the move by some Republican-controlled states, in, including Virginia, to change how electoral college votes are apportioned? Historically, the winner of a state gets all of the allotted votes, but there's a move now to allocate electoral votes by congressional district, wouldn't that virtually guarantee a Republican lock on the presidency due to the existing gerrymandered districts? I mean, and, and obviously, I mean, I'm assuming I mean, that's not would, constitutional either. It, it would make it very difficult for a Democrat to win. So, yeah, well, I mean, there are two proposals on the table. One proposal is to take these very gerrymandered maps and essentially lay the presidential election on top of them. So instead of Pennsylvania or Michigan or Wisconsin, all of which are blue states, allocating their electoral votes to the winner of the state as a whole, they'll allocate them one apiece to the winner of each of these gerrymandered districts and 
because of the gerrymandered means that the Republicans guaranteed to get the overwhelming majority of the votes in those states. Um, yeah, and that's cheating. Um, and, you, you know, as I said before, in this country, we pick our own leaders. We don't have them chosen for us. Um, there's, a, there's another version of this cheat, um, which is proportional representation. And the idea here is to say that if the Republican gets 40% of the vote, the Republican should also get 40% of the electoral votes. That, if you want to do it nationwide, could potentially be a workable system. But what the Republicans are proposing there is to do it, again, only in states like Pennsylvania, which are solid blue states. So Pennsylvania will give away 40% or so of its electoral votes to the Republican for free. And Texas, which is a solid red state, will continue to give all of its electoral votes away to the Republican. So, yeah, I mean, they, they want to rig the election. They want to rig the election by having one set of rules in blue states and another set of rules in red states. They want to set these rules up so that Republicans get as many automatic votes as possible. And, you, you know, it's, it's trying to rig an election. It's clearly a cheat, um, and it shouldn't be allowed to happen. Do progressives themselves bear part of the blame for having the temerity to choose to live near each other and congregate in big cities? Well, again, I, I don't think that redistricting is something, that, you know, having fair maps is intention with other principles, whether that's making sure that there's equal opportunity for minorities or whether that's making sure that um, different geographic regions have the same amount of say. So the way that Republicans have drawn the maps in a lot of these very gerrymandered states is they've packed as many voters as possible into the city districts. So, you know, in your cities, you might have districts that are 80 or 90 percent Democrat, and they're very tiny districts. They just take up a little bit of the city. And then out in the rural areas, that gives them all this space to play with where they can create districts that are maybe 55 or 60 percent Republican. So they're less intensely red than the very blue gerrymandered uh, Democratic districts. And that way, like, the Republican votes wind up counting more because you have less wasted votes um, in the Republican districts. Um, there's plenty of ways you can draw a map to prevent that. You can draw a map that looks like a pie where, like, the narrow bit of the pie goes in and picks up a little bit of the city, and then it fans out to the more rural, more Republican areas. You know, you, know, you can do a pinwheel shape. There's plenty of ways to draw districts that make sure that both Democrats and Republicans have equal say in, um, in uh, you know, or at least say relative to their representation of their state in who their um, representatives are going to be. Okay. Or let's just let the popular vote carry the uh, carry it for the day. But, you know, I well, mean, you can certainly do that at the presidential level, right? I mean, right. So, right. You know, I don't think it would make sense to have one election for the whole United States that whoever wins it gets the entire Congress. But you know, at the presidential level, you could certainly do the national popular vote. Yeah. Okay. Ian Milheiser, senior constitutional policy analyst for the Center for American Progress. Ian, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. We look forward to speaking with you again soon. Sure thing. Thanks very much. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for Stand Up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to Democrats for America's Future to keep this show on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press and his guest, Rhode Island Congressman David Cicilline, who says the House Republican budget is immoral. Hey, you know me as a Californian, uh, and you also probably know that I was born in Delaware. So those are my kind of top two states. A close runner-up, my wife Carol, is from the state of Rhode Island, grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. So spent a lot of time in Rhode Island, too, which is why I'm particularly happy to welcome to uh, our program this morning, Congressman David Cicilline, former mayor of Providence, now representing Rhode Island's first congressional district. Uh, hey, Congressman, good to have you with us. 
Good morning. Great to be with you. Thank you. You join a long and you're line. a wise you're a wise man to marry a woman from Rhode Island. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Joey Palino, former mayor of uh, Providence, another good friend of mine uh, up there. So uh, we got a lot lot in common, and um, and then then there's a, the legendary Buddy Cianci too. Uh, <laughs> now a now a talk show host. Now a talk show host. I know. I actually read his book, uh, and it's a it's 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 a fun book. He certainly had a he certainly had a checkered career. Mm-hmm. So, Congressman, um, you watching from Rhode Island? I want to ask you how the Rhode Island legislature is dealing with this issue of marriage equality. But first, what's your take on the last two days watching this as an openly gay man watching the Supreme Court uh, from from your perspective? Well, I mean, I think, you know, uh, it was very exciting to listen to the arguments. I think the court, I mean, I think the first thing is just to acknowledge the context. In many, many ways, we as a country have really moved uh, so far. And I think the most recent polling shows that the American people, a majority of the American people support marriage equality. Mm-hmm. When you look at young you know, people, it's, you know, almost, it's over 80 percent. So it's really generational. So I think really the, the task is how quickly the court will catch up to where the American people already are. Um, and I think yesterday's, uh, the last two days of arguments reveals that they're likely to say uh, that the Proposition 8 case should not be before them. It sounded like they were almost irritated that they had taken the case. <laughs> I know. Um, you wonder, like, you guys voted to take this case. Right. You know, it didn't just show up. But um, I think they're going to, it sounds like they are likely to uh, dismiss that in some, by some mechanism. And that, I think, is a good thing. It would then mean the lower court decision mm-hmm. in validating Proposition 8 would be reinstated. And so marriage equality would come to the state of California again. Right. And I think it's pretty clear that they are... Um, very likely to find that DOMA is unconstitutional uh, and that the federal government if, must recognize when a state says a couple is married, they are married, that has always been the case, and DOMA was uh, unconstitutional and strike it down, and I think it will be a huge victory for those of us who believe in marriage equality. And I think it's just inevitable. It's, it's a, just a question of at what pace it's going to happen, but I don't think there's any question it's already happening. And, you know, on that issue of, of uh, DOMA, leave it to um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right, to sum it up in terms that everybody could understand. Just a quick right. clip here for uh, our listeners and our viewers this morning. You've heard it before, of course. You would be really diminishing what the state has said is marriage. You're saying, no, state, there are two kinds of marriages, the full marriage and then the sort of skim milk marriage. Skim milk marriage. Right. Well, and also what was great was the response of the attorney who says, oh, no, no, the reason that Dumb was enacted so that all gay couples would be treated the same, you know, unfairly and <laughs> badly, but the same. You know, it's like it's such a ridiculous argument. They didn't have a good argument either no. day. I don't think the opposition no. did not have a good argument. So um, this morning, Evan Wolfson, who um, you probably know, so yeah. I know you know, is the founder of Freedom to Marry, told us that there, even before June, he thinks there are four states where they can uh, achieve marriage equality before the justices would rule, and Rhode Island is one of them. What, uh, what's your take on that? Uh, I, I think he's right. You know, we have uh, a very supportive governor uh, who supports marriage equality. Uh, our House of Representatives passed overwhelmingly uh, from a unanimous House Judiciary Committee and then passed it very strongly on the floor, and it is now before the Senate Judiciary Committee. And there's tremendous momentum and um, you know, we're the only New England state that currently doesn't provide for mm. marriage equality, and the time is long past for us to join our New England states, and I think this will be the year that it will happen. Well, I, I hope you're right, and counting on your leadership up there, and I hope uh, also the justices make uh, marriage equality legal again uh, in uh, my adopted state of California. And by the way, Delaware, my home state, is one of the others that Evan is working on right now, and he thinks there's a good chance for Delaware before June, too. So we'll keep working on that. Congressman, you've also been uh, an open critic of the Ryan budget. I guess my question is, they tried this budget, you know, two years in a row. Uh, It didn't go anywhere. Uh, they didn't change it at all. They brought it back a third time. You know, what the hell? Is well, going it's actually, on? they did change it. It's actually worse. It's like the <laughs> Ryan budget on steroids. I mean, it's really shocking. I'm serving on the budget committee now, and this is a budget 
which you know follows so many of the same principles, but only you know makes the the cuts even deeper. You know, ends the guarantee of Medicare and turns it into a voucher. Mm-hmm. Provides a gigantic tax cut by moving the tax rate from 39.6 percent to 25 percent for the richest people in this country. Yeah. And then says it's revenue neutral, which means other folks, middle class and working poor folks, are going to make up the revenue. It makes deep cuts in education and Pell grants and infrastructure preserve subsidies for big oil and billions of dollars in subsidies, tax breaks and incentives that ship American jobs overseas. It's like we, we saw this already. It was rejected by the voters resoundingly in these congressional and presidential mm-hmm. elections. And it's as if they didn't, it's as if they were not around on November 4th. You know, it's like we, 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 there was a actually public discussion about this approach, which was rejected, but it has not prevented them from trying it again. And um, I think so long as they're in control of the House, they're going to keep trying that, which is why I think it is so important for us to take back the House and bring some common sense and good reason to public policy. Oh, from your lips to God's ears. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I, I was amused and also annoyed, I guess, last week when the Re- Republican National Committee issued this big report. They called it the autopsy, right, and what went wrong right. in November. As you point out, you wonder if some of them even realized there was an election and they lost. But one of the things in that report, they said, we, we have to stop being the party of corporate welfare. <laughs> but when, when you look at the Ryan budget and when you look at John Boehner says, no, we won't close any tax loopholes, they are the party of corporate welfare, aren't right. they? Well, and it's also that they are fighting ferociously to preserve corporate welfare and these tax loopholes that benefit big corporations and the wealthiest mm-hmm. Americans. And they're doing it in order to and, and they're doing it so that they can at the same time make deep cuts in the social safety net and, and as, it, as important, very deep cuts in the things that we have to invest in to grow our economy and get people back to work. And so they say, oh, you know, we have to end the guarantee of Medicare. We can't afford it mm. so they can mm. finance another tax cut for people at the very top. Yeah. I mean, it's immoral. I mean, it's really that document. I think if anyone has a question of what is the difference between Democrats and Republicans in the House, come to the budget committee and see these two documents the democratic alternative which which reduces the deficit in a responsible way by cutting spending but at the same time recognizes we need to grow the economy and create jobs and invest in things that will do that like infrastructure and education and research and science and all the things we know are necessary to to continue to lead the world and to grow jobs we're talking with Congresswoman, a uh, congressman. I'm sorry, Congressman David Cicilline from uh, Rhode Island here on uh, this Thursday edition of the Full Court Press. And Congressman, I saw that the Rhode Island delegation recently uh, held a, a meeting or a seminar on the issue of gun violence uh, and what steps we might take. Where do you see the Congress uh, on this issue? Are they going to have the courage to do something this year? Uh, I hope so. Look, I you know when I worked. Uh, In the state general assembly, this was one of the issues I worked the most on, and I'm a founding member of Mayors Against Illegal Guns with Tom Menino and Michael Mm Bloomberg. So this is something I've worked on for a long time, and it is incredibly frustrating to me that we are not having already passed common sense, responsible gun safety legislation. No one is suggesting people don't have a right to have a firearm, but we have a responsibility uh, and an obligation to be sure that people who are criminals or seriously mentally ill don't have access to firearms. We should pass universal background checks. We should ban the most dangerous assault weapons, which are weapons of war from the neighborhoods of our cities and towns. Uh, we should ensure that, that, that um, every single sale of a firearm goes through a background check. We should close the gun show loophole, the fire sale uh, loophole, which is the legislation I've introduced. Um, mm-hmm. If you're a licensed gun dealer, a federally licensed gun dealer, and your license is revoked because you've engaged in misconduct or you yeah. haven't done the proper, you are, your entire inventory is deemed a personal collection. You are then free to transfer and oh, sell it without no. any background. So we actually reward. Oh, no. yeah. yeah, we oh, actually goodness. reward bad behavior. I mean, it's oh. just... These are so. My bill just says if you're a federally licensed gun dealer and you lose your license for misconduct, yeah. you are required to sell your inventory to a federally licensed gun dealer, so that all those rules will still apply. I mean, these are common sense provisions. We lost, you know, 20 first grade children were slaughtered by gun violence in this country, if, and six adults. If this most recent horrific violence doesn't cause us to do something, shame on all of us in Congress. Yeah, shame on us indeed. 
Congressman, it's so good to have you with us this morning. Hey, when you get back in town, come on by and see us in the studio. I'd love to have Absolutely. you. Absolutely, I'd love to. We'll, go, we'll, so get some, we'll have some Johnny cake for you. There you, you go. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Congressman David Sicily. What's Johnny cake? Ask Carol what's Johnny okay, cake. Okay, all right. I have to find you out know what Johnny cake, cake is. is. You've never been to Rhode Island. Yeah. All right. It's the Full Court Press on a Thursday. <laughs> That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Simon Johnson, Ian Milheiser, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us, support the show, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to America's